Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're going deep on investment returns, mm -hmm. but with a twist. A twist. Yeah, going way beyond like just the averages and risk. Okay, I'm intrigued. We're going to explore something most people haven't even thought about. It could totally change your investment game, though. It's called the skewness of returns. Ah, skewness. Love it. And you actually sent in a paper on this, portfolio size, portfolio composition, and the skewness of returns. Yes. This paper is really packed with insights about how the types of companies you invest in and even like the number of stocks you hold can really impact your chances of hitting those massive gains. So it's not just about, you know, finding a stock with a high average return. There's a whole nother layer of analysis we should be doing. Like most people don't even know about this. It's true. Most people don't. You could have two investments, same average return, same risk level. Okay. But the one with positive skew, that's the one that's going to have a higher chance of those huge like outlier returns. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more Quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Okay, I'm starting to get it. But let's back up for a sec. Sure. What exactly is skewness? I'm not going to lie. It's not a term I hear every day. Right. So it's all about the shape of the returns. Like, imagine a graph, right? Okay, yeah. Plotting all the possible returns of an investment. Okay. If it's perfectly symmetrical, like a bell curve, we say it's uh, normally distributed. Hmm. But if it's, you know, lopsided, longer tail on one side, yeah. then boom, it's skewed. So a positive skew means there's a greater chance of those big positive returns, even if the average return isn't, like, amazing on paper. Exactly. And you know what's really fascinating? Right. Individual stock returns, they tend to be positively skewed. Oh, really? Yeah. This paper analyzed CRSP stock data from 1990 to 2021, and the results were clear. Individual stocks, way higher chance of those massive gains than you might expect, just from looking at their average returns. Hmm. That's interesting. But wouldn't that mean that a portfolio of stocks would also be positively skewed? You'd think. Right. I mean, you're just like combining a bunch of individual stocks. That's where it gets really interesting. The research shows something else. As you add more stocks to your portfolio, the skewness actually flips. It becomes negative. Hold on. So you're saying diversification, which is supposed to be yeah. like the golden rule, could actually reduce my chances of hitting those big returns. It's kind of counterintuitive, right? Totally. It is. It's a key takeaway from this paper, though. They actually came up with a mathematical model to explain it based on like news and information flow. So basically, when you have a lot of different stocks, okay. any positive news that might like impact one stock, it's likely to be offset by negative news impacting another. Oh, I see. So it dampens the extreme positives. Makes it more negatively skewed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's almost like you're trading the chance of massive gain for a like more stable but maybe less exciting return. That's a good way to put it. Of course, diversification is still you know super important for managing risk, but it's not a perfect solution. It's about finding that sweet spot between reducing risk and keeping the potential for those outsized returns. So if someone's really after those home runs, they maybe need to rethink too much diversification. It's something to consider for sure, and it gets even deeper. The paper shows the types of companies you invest in also make a difference to the skewness. Okay, now I'm really interested. Tell me more about that. What did they find? Well, they found some pretty interesting stuff. Like for example, portfolios that are really heavy on large companies, you know, those established players. Yeah, like the big blue chips. Exactly. Those tend to have more negative skew than portfolios that are more focused on smaller companies. Hmm. So those big, safe companies maybe aren't the best bet if you're looking for those massive gains. It's not that they're bad investments or anything. They can definitely be good for stability, dividends, all that. Right, right. But if you're really gunning for like those 10x, 100x returns, yeah. the research suggests that smaller companies might be where you want to look. I guess that makes sense. They have more room to grow, right? So maybe their returns are just more volatile in both directions. Right. More upside potential, but also more downside risk. And the same logic actually seems to apply to growth companies, too. Okay. You mean those companies that are, like, 
still in their early stages, lots of potential, but maybe also lots of uncertainty. Yeah, exactly. They found that portfolios with a lot of growth stocks also tended to show more negative skew. Interesting. So large companies and growth companies can both contribute to that negative skew. What about the green companies? Mm. You know, the ones everyone's talking about these days, the ones focused on like sustainability and all that. Oh, yeah. They actually looked at those, too. And this is where it gets kind of surprising. I bet. Did those green companies with all the hype around them, do they have positive skew? Like you'd expect, right? I think so, wouldn't you? Yeah. But actually, no. They found that portfolios of green stocks actually had more negative skew than portfolios of brown companies. Well, that's really surprising. Why would that be? I mean, you'd think with all the excitement around green technologies and all that, those companies would have a higher chance of those big breakout returns. It's a good question. And to be honest, the paper doesn't really have a definitive answer, but there are a couple of possible explanations. First, you know, we were talking about growth companies and how they tend to contribute to negative skew. Yeah. Well, a lot of green companies are still in those early stages, right? They're, you know, innovating and disrupting things. And that just comes with a lot of uncertainty. So basically, while there's like a ton of potential in the green space, those companies are also more likely to have those big swings in either direction making their returns more negatively skewed. That's one way to think about it. Plus, the green sector is still pretty new and it's changing so fast. Yeah, true. Like regulations are changing, technologies are developing, consumer preferences are shifting. It's just a really dynamic environment which can make things more volatile. And that volatility could be contributing to that negative skew. So it's like there's this kind of paradox. Yeah. On one hand, a lot of investors are excited about green companies because they see the potential for big returns, you know, with the whole transition to a more sustainable economy and everything. Right. But on the other hand, the very things that create that potential, like the growth, the innovation, the fact that everything is changing so fast, those things also contribute to that negative skew, which means there's a higher chance of, you know, significant losses. Yeah, it's a great way to summarize it. And it really shows how important it is to think about skewness as a separate thing from like risk and average returns. Yeah, that makes sense. It's not enough to just look at those traditional metrics. You got to look at the whole picture, you know, the shape of the returns, those potential extreme outcomes to really make good decisions. This has been like really eye opening. I'm definitely gonna have to rethink how I approach building my portfolio now. Glad to hear it. Before we move on, though, I do have one more question. Yeah. This research, it was all about U.S. stocks, right? Right. So what about other things like bonds or even, to, you know, those crazy cryptocurrencies. Does skewness work the same way with those? That's a great question. And it's something we should definitely talk about. Skewness isn't limited to just stocks. You know, it's relevant for all sorts of different asset classes. And understanding how it works in each one can really help you tailor your investment strategy. OK, so let's talk about how this whole skewness thing works with different types of investments. You were saying it's not just about stocks. Exactly. Skewness is relevant across the board. And, you know, understanding how it varies can really help you figure out how to approach, well, you know, your whole investment strategy. We were talking about bonds before the break, right? Those are usually considered like the safer option, aren't they? Lower risk, but also probably lower returns. Yeah, that's the general idea. And when you look at the skewness of bond returns, it kind of reflects that. Mm -hmm. They typically have like much lower skewness than stocks. So those really extreme outcomes, both the big wins and the big losses, they're just less likely. OK, so with bonds, you're less likely to hit a home run, but also less likely to, you know, completely crash and burn. Yeah, pretty much. It's all about that trade off, right? Exactly. Bonds can be really appealing for people who, you know, really want to protect their money, get some steady income. But if you're really looking for those huge explosive returns, bonds might not be the most exciting place to be. Yeah, that makes sense. So what about something like crypto? Oh, crypto. I mean, it's known for being pretty wild, right? <laughs> those price swings can be crazy. So where does that fit into this whole skewness thing? Crypto is a really interesting case, actually, because the returns are often super, super positively skewed, like even more so than individual stocks. You know, we've all heard the stories, right? People put in a little bit of money and boom, they're millionaires overnight. Yeah. But I'm guessing that comes with a downside, too. Like, 
a higher chance of losing big as well. Oh yeah, for sure. Crypto is incredibly volatile. The prices, they can go up and down like crazy. So yeah, mm -hmm. the potential for those you know astronomical gains is there, but the risk of big losses is definitely there too. So with crypto, it's almost like, like you're rolling the dice and hoping for the best. It's a high risk, high reward kind of game, definitely. And this is where understanding skewness is really important. It's not just about, you know, hoping to get lucky. It's about knowing that those extreme outcomes are possible and then, you know, making decisions based on how much risk you're comfortable with. What are your goals? That kind of thing. OK, so we've talked about stocks, bonds, even crypto. Mm -hmm. What's the big takeaway here? Like, how can we actually use this knowledge about skewness mm -hmm. to, you know, make better decisions about our investments across all these different types of assets? The key is to match your investment strategy to your own risk tolerance right. and your goals. So if you're OK with things being a little bit more volatile, if you're really looking for those you know, outsized returns, then you might be OK with a portfolio that has more positive skew, even though that means there's a higher chance of losses along the way. But if you're more risk averse, yeah, like if you really want to protect your money and just get like steady returns. Right then you'd probably want a portfolio with less of that negative skew. Exactly. It's about finding what works for you. Skewness is just another tool to help you understand the, the whole picture. You know, it's not some magic formula or anything, but it's definitely something that can help you make smarter decisions. I got to say, this has been a really fascinating deep dive. We've gone way beyond the basics here, talking about a concept that I'm guessing most people have never even heard of, but it's so important. It really changes how you think about investing. Yeah. It's a good reminder that there's always more to learn and that understanding these, you know, these sometimes hidden concepts can really give you an advantage. So to everyone listening out there, don't just settle for the average. Keep digging deeper, challenge your assumptions and keep learning about those hidden factors that can really make a difference in your financial journey. Couldn't have said it better myself. Knowledge is power, especially when it comes to your money. Well, that about wraps up another deep dive. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next time to explore more of the ideas shaping the world of finance and beyond. Until then, keep learning, keep questioning, and keep investing wisely. <laughs> <laughs>